And uh, in this session, I wanted to take a bit of a departure from the focus on metrics so far in the module and, uh, and contextualize sustainability metrics in, uh, in the long durée in a more temporal context. And so I decided that uh, we should look at the work of an energy historian, uh, Timothy Moss. Uh, Tim Moss is someone whose work I greatly admire and I've uh, had the privilege, uh, we've had the privilege of having him over um, to visit us uh, on previous occasions. And, um, and what I really like um, before we watch a couple of uh, his videos is that he's a historian who engages not only with the past, but also with the present. Um, he has a book coming out with MIT Press uh, this year that looks at the last hundred years of energy and water infrastructure in Berlin. He's a historian of, uh, of Berlin and of urban energy infrastructure. And, um, and so I wanted to take this opportunity to not only look at um, some of that work, but also to discuss what energy historians are able to do um, methodologically and in terms of understanding cities that um, that we could take instruction from and that that kind of discussion i think is also really important for understanding uh, our own uh, the value of our own work where people from quite different uh, disciplinary backgrounds on this course but i don't think we have any historians in our midst uh, but correct me if i'm wrong and uh, and one thing that i think it can help to do to to look into how a historian works on these issues is to recognize the limits and opportunities that we have at our disposal based on our own disciplines and partly perhaps uh, how we can take instruction from or engage with disciplines that have a very um, different point of departure. And then we're also able to look at a time in this case where metrics for urban transformation might not have had much to do with sustainability at all. So um, let's watch two short uh, clips, eight to 10 minutes each. The first one is called, uh, is called Invisible Berlin. There's a seven part uh, um, video documentary made uh, with Tim Moss uh, and the Gerda Henkel Foundation um, on his work. So we'll watch the first one and then a short clip called Berlin's Got Gas, which is uh, further down the series and looks at some of the urban energy infrastructure. And you're welcome to watch the rest if you're interested on your own later on. Right. So lots to take in. And, uh, and we come full circle to working group four for their second go at uh, leading the video discussion today. So we've um, divided the questions amongst us. Um, so I'm going to do question one. Um, but before that, just to note one thing that came up that we couldn't help notice was that um, there was not a, not a single woman in these two videos. And there seems to be a need for um, yeah transformation of the kind of technology engineering space. So I guess it's good to see we have so many women on this course. Um, um, yeah, so question one, um, how, uh, let's see, what methodological challenges and advantages do energy historians encounter when they study urban development? Um, so on one side, you can say that physical, the physical nature of infrastructure uh, allows you to develop methodologies to observe a physical object. And this can also sometimes allow you to observe a physical change through time, like we saw in the video um, in the, the gas related um, plant. Um, but then when it comes to tracing the political, politically complex environment that shaped and generated the shifts in, in, the, in uh, infrastructure through time, it potentially becomes a bit harder because you depend on historical records um, some of which might be hard to trace um, some of which may be lost but also a history 
that is recorded by someone. And uh, there's a question of, of the biased nature through which history might have been recorded. Um, like the guy in the video said, um, the history of, uh, of infrastructure was written by engineers. Um, and so depending on what complementary historical records you have, you might only get a very small picture of, of the context. And one which may largely be missing is the, is the kind of the, the lived experience of the infrastructure um, that will be hard to, to come to, to grasp uh, through existing records. Um, I guess another, another challenge is the bringing together of two quite different skills in bringing the infrastructure aspect together with history uh, that the analytical and methodologically methodological approaches required uh, are potentially quite different um, so you need to be able to to grasp both i think that's um it for question one yes um and regarding hmm. question two um, before yes. we go there would it be okay to just uh, just see if there's any any other thoughts uh, in response to the first question? I'd, I'd like to just chip in with, uh, with a point building on uh, something Katinka said, which is that it can be diff you're limited to what is available and that can often be a certain kind of perspective. Um, for instance, a gendered one. <clears throat> Uh, for instance, uh, history is written by the victors, they say, and so uh, the dominant hegemonic perspective. But and and you also mentioned that you know you can miss a sense of the lived experience. I think it's worth noting that there are some fantastic accounts also that historians have been able to excavate on uh, on that kind of lived experience. A book that I really like is called *The Disenchanted Knight*. That's uh, Shivel Bush. And uh, I just noticed I have, uh, I have one here that I'm balancing the screen on. It's called At Day's Close, Night in Times Past. It's by Roger Ekirsch. And we often forget um, that things as we know them are a very limited frame of reference uh, that's become normalized only in the last few decades or maybe a century. And, and so it's really... I really encourage anyone who hasn't, I uh, haven't read much of this literature, but I've really found it enjoyable too and enlightening. Um, there's also a book that stars Benedict, uh, a film that stars Benedict Cumberbatch that came out about the, it's called The the Current Wars, or I think that's it. Um, it's about 1880 and the race to electrify um, Chicago and it goes into um, that that whole historical period. So yeah, lots uh, lots of interesting things that people have done despite those challenges. But uh, I'll pass back to Marie, sorry to break in there. Uh, okay. Um, so question two is, um, how is this different for, for researchers who focus on current urban developments than regarding the methodolog uh, methodological challenges and advantages? Uh, so, in general, um, I think that researchers need to understand and explain the situation and the needs of the present. And this can be more difficult than looking back uh, in order to explain something that happened in the past. Um, so this implies that one does not know exactly how the infrastructure will change and develop into the future and um, one should then be able to visual, uh, visualize the needs, uh, the wants and the politics uh, of the present in order to then understand how urban development can be shaped uh, in the present and for the future. Um, and also today on current urban development uh, one needs to incorporate uh, sustainable uh, development goals uh, and indicators that we have talked about. And the, this was not an issue of the past. Um, and one also needs to be more inclusive. 
uh, and speak to a diversity of people and ensure that all voices are heard and different perspectives are included. Um, and this was not so much the case for in, in the past where the decision makers were free to make decisions without much interference from the public. So yeah, that was uh, my point. I don't know if I missed out on something. The group thinks I've summed up what we, what we came up with. Okay. Anybody who wants to, uh, to add to Marie's points, also from beyond the group? Did it, did it strike you, Marie, that there were things that you had not thought of in your work that came to mind when, when looking at the videos? Um, well, there were lots of things that came to my mind uh, looking at the videos. I haven't really thought about, I don't really knew much about these uh, subjects on beforehand, really. So it was quite interesting for me how much you could, you know, find out about the past and uh, the political, uh, you know, the political situation and the re relationship between between countries and uh, and all that, and that you can see that in the development of the infrastructure. I found it uh, found it very interesting in general. Um, I had a thought on on this kind of research on infrastructures that's maybe not really related to the question, but I uh, often uh, I've often seen that um, infrastructures uh, get termed to be invisible, or that this is uh, often an, an approach to studying infrastructures. And I thought it's also, on the other hand, it's quite a clever move for researchers to to term or to label something as invisible, because then it's obviously a, an interesting point to start off with. And I think um, this is some somehow runs also the danger of generalizing, because in many other contexts, switching the light on or turning the tap on is probably not such a uh, such a uh, normal thing, because sometimes it doesn't work or whatever, or it's not even easy to, well, there is no tap or something. And, getting to, to water infrastructure is some very different thing, not such a normal invisible gesture. And then on the other hand, maybe also in other cases, infrastructures are the opposite from invisible being monumentalized or highly, highly glorified or something. So I've often seen this, this argument that inf the infrastructures tend to be invisible and we only see them when they are not working. I think that's uh, well. That's true for some for some occasions, but uh, far from being uh, universal. Thanks, Lucas. That's a really interesting point. I think it was also one of the highlights for me when this informant talks about how people have stopped thinking of it as political, and uh, and I guess if you take a socio spatial perspective uh, rather than a temporal one, you could say that it depends where you look. So I'm glad you flagged that point. If I can say something, I, um, uh, the fact this question of whether infrastructures are invisible or not, I mean, I think they are, in one sense, they are invisible because they've been sort of worked into our routines and, and we take them for granted, etc. But, but um, for me, working on, on the urban planning and climate, uh, climate issues, um, urban planners are really sort of today struggling with the infrastructures of the past. And they, they, the infrastructures of the past are a very, very present and clear limitation or condition for what, what we can do today. I mean, where are the roads built? Where do we have bridges? Where do we have, we have metro lines and bus lines and, and these sorts of things? So, um, so uh, planners really, really struggle with these issues. And I, and, and I, I tell um, a lot of the students that we graduate from uh, our university here end up uh, as urban planners 
and I uh, always tell them that they have the most important job in the world because the decisions that they make about where to put infrastructure and what type of infrastructure to build um, doesn't just shape the, the future or shape the world as it is today, but the way that the world will be many decades into the future. So I really think that that's, uh, you know, that it is really one of the sort of those types of decisions are incredibly important in, in how society shapes decades going, going forward. So, yeah. Thanks, Robert. Let's move, uh, move on to the next question then. Yeah, uh, so question number three, how do the factors that drive urban energy transitions today differ from the past? Um, well, our discussion focused basically on um, that we identified uh, two main drivers. One is uh, political and the other is science. On the scientific perspective, um, currently we see the transitions, uh, well, both, uh, all transitions go into a more technological phase. Um, but current transition is going into more an efficient energy transition compared to what we saw in the past. Um, now we're adding a, a component that's called a very important component. That's the, the social aspect and the environmental um, concern. Sustainability is playing a major issue here in the past this component, we never really talked about the participatory approaches or uh, how the finite resources would have to be taken care of. So uh, this lack of consciousness uh, was not a transcendent point in the past history. And now it is becoming part of our daily uh, basis to to take decisions and that's also the reasons we have this common uh, worldwide accepted path of uh, SDGs as a guide like worldwide uh, guidelines that we see now that applies to basically everything we do so um, from the scientific point of view this is the main change we see from the past uh, to to the present relationships and we also see um, uh, we discuss there is this political driver that's always intrinsic, that's always there uh, to show there is always a manifestation of power relationships. We we just watch in the in the video that um, Berlin preferred to import gas, natural gas, from uh, Russia. So they don't have this affectation from um, the, the, the German um, Western side. So again, this is a political constraint that's still playing a major role in, in our current lives. And that brings us with uh, a political renewable energy decisions that we are still struggling in uh, developing countries and are still uh, politics are making this driver and that's also a constraint into a sustainability process. So there are common roots but with different um, and modern um, ways of addressing the issues. So basically um, that was our, our, our discussion on, on the drivers and how we, we could update to current situations. Thanks. Any other thoughts in the room on this question of uh, of social political regimes and uh, and how there's some persistence in patterns? I mean, it's uh, it, in a sense it's obvious that they they differ, but uh, I think this came up earlier. Uh, Marie mentioned that there was much less consideration, explicit consideration of sustainability. And those sorts of metrics uh, just just a few decades ago, um, and perhaps it's gone up uh, to take up even more significance just in recent years. So, 
that is uh, it's it's worth considering that that's quite a a recent change in the conversation. All right, shall we move on to the, the fourth question then? Yeah, uh, question four. So um, how do or can uh, you bring a temporal perspective into your work on urban transitions? Um, so um, our initial sort of thought is that transitions in itself is temporal in nature, where it's basically a description of some form of process of change from a, uh, from an initial phase to another one, so from a less sustainable to a more sustainable future in, in that sense. So essentially looking into urban transitions has to incorporate some form of temporal dimension to it. And that can basically be identified by looking back into the videos uh, of looking into the past in some sense and trying to identify and understand the present based on these, pre these previous actions that we took in the past. So. Uh, in some sense, the inclusion of the historical perspective would actually enrich our understanding of current, uh, uh, the current state, including uh, current mobility, current different infrastructures uh, in the urban uh, realm. Um, and to give an example, for instance, Natalie's uh, presentation on Copenhagen actually sort of looked into uh, the politics of mobility and how they evolve uh, in some sense through time uh, to, to better understand uh, what, how, how Copenhagen was shaped and, shaped and why it is shaped in this way in the present. So it is an opportunity to learn from the past in, in sort of a temporal way. Uh, and this understanding of the past can then be used also in a temporal sort of discussion to look into future trajectories in some sense, where one can start looking into the different scenarios uh, that the current action can lead to temporally in the future. So essentially it's, it's, uh, it's uh, it's 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 a heavily temporal discussion, and it's basically um, a matter of looking into these temporal dimensions, regardless of what kind of urban transition you're looking into, whether it is a sustainable one or, for instance, in the global south, from a, from an informal to a formal one. In that sense, it is essential to look into um, the temporal dimension, especially in transitions. Yeah. yeah. Anybody wants to pick up on that? Um, I was thinking here about uh, also the book that we've been reading, Kupa, from Kupa Kumar, um, which where the working group I'm in particular discussed the second chapter. I think uh, it's a shame that not all of us have read it maybe at this point because uh, it's a historization of uh, the, the development of congestion. And it really shows how how you know, certain material elements are um, expressions or materializations of uh, certain historical policies and approaches to to urban development and approaches to so, to yeah some solutions to pro identified problems and um, taking this into account, I think. Uh, is probably relevant to all our works to a certain degree. Thanks, I think that's really valuable. I'm reminded of a, a piece that uh, colleague uh, Jacob Grandin, who I mentioned earlier, and I wrote on, uh, on temporalities, I shared a link, um, where we talk about um, the nature of local sustainability transitions and to what extent they're, they stick or they're durable or maybe just ephemeral and perhaps the intent is not always to have something that's lasting either. So there's different ways to think about uh, these, about, you know, the sociology of time is interesting, thinking of processual analysis. I think there's a lot of work that can help um, kind of frame transitions in different ways. But certainly, Lucas, to go back to your earlier point about infrastructure, I think it's, it's worth thinking what's specific to social materiality within urban contexts um, with proximity to decision makers, what makes um, processes of change work in certain ways in those contexts or driven by or from those contexts. Um, what is the, the, uh, the cognitive understanding of change that's at play? And I say this because even if one, you know, I think everybody looks at, 
some kind of historical trajectory in the work, even if it's very contemporary for, for the last quarter century or decade or whatever, depending on what you're looking at. Um, a work like Tim Moss looking sort of over the long durée of the past century and sometimes longer that has uh, it makes certain other kinds of um, perceptions possible but certainly one thing to keep in mind with energy infrastructure in particular is that the decisions being made now are really concretizing urban futures and energy futures for the next decades so when we think about 2050 when we think about things like uh, 1.5 degrees celsius we're there now in 2020 there's uh, not very much time left at all and so we are studying history already even when we're looking at the present if we're trying to work towards certain kinds of futures yeah that's a that's a thought i wanted to share are there any other thoughts on on the general theme and if if you want to go back to the discussion we had earlier in the module on on sustainability metrics you're welcome to as well i know it's not a very obvious or direct connection but i hope you see see the relevance of stepping back in time also just to help us to think a bit uh, methodologically as part of this course uh, I had a thought, maybe going back also a few days to uh, the example I shared about the industrial area with the residential area beside it. Um, so this development happened really like 70 or something years ago. So this area was a remote area. It had an industrial area and then it became uh, a residential area in, in, in afterwards. Uh, and really understanding the problem that uh, occurred due to this uh, incident or uh, due to the informal settlements that happened uh, beside the industrial areas or the industrial plants were, which were uh, individually located at far parts but not in an industrial zone in itself or something, uh, became um, something like a point of view for future development in the industrial areas to have them as uh, separate uh, entities, to, uh, to have their separate infrastructure, to make sure that the area beside them is already developed uh, or has a plan for development when they were uh, planned uh, to avoid this type of situation uh, occurring again. And I think this um, uh, links too much to the tempor temporal perspective uh, of, of urban transitions. And this all happened in the recent history. So it's not going so much back as just last 70 years. So uh, just linking everything together. Yeah. Thanks, Great, well, I, I think uh, that might be a good point at which to wrap up this module. Thanks for your attention. And uh, before we close for the day, I think we can go into a couple of logistical questions. <laughs>